morning to all our uh, watchers, listeners in the United States. Good afternoon uh, to Europe. Uh, good evening to Afghanistan. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And thank, thank you also to those watching on C-SPAN. My name is Fred Kemp. I'm president and CEO of the Atlantic Council. It's an honor to open today's conversation jointly hosted by the Atlantic Council's South Asia Center and Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Afghanistan faces a stark reality as the United States prepares to withdraw, withdraw its troops from the country after two decades on the ground, the, at the looming September 11th deadline and the now postponed Istanbul conference underscore the urgent need for robust, sustained and coordinated international action in Afghanistan and for Afghanistan to compensate for the security political and humanitarian consequences of the withdrawal. Our South Asia Center has proven itself to be a leading voice on Afghanistan for months. High level experts, officials and scholars from the United States, Afghanistan and Europe have been coming together to study and advance solutions for the future of Afghanistan as part of the strategic dialogues in partnership with Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Chaired by Secretary Madeleine Albright, Director Federica Mogherini and Chairperson Shahrzad Akbar, very important, an American woman, a European woman, an Afghan woman. The dialogues sought to look beyond the current moment and focus on a long-term strategic outlook that ensures stability in Afghanistan in line with Afghan, US and European interests and values, shared values of Europe the United States and Afghanistan alike. Today, we launch a transatlantic charter and we'll discuss the need for deepened transatlantic cooperation in the Afghan space. I'd like to take a moment to thank our colleagues at Rockefeller Brothers Fund for partnering on the strategic dialogues and especially Stephen Heinz, who has been a longtime advocate supporter of the Afghan people and of the Afghanistan and, and the Afghanistan future. I also want to give a special thanks to non-resident senior fellows, Sahar Halamzai and Marika Theros for spearheading this incredible conversation that has now culminated in the transatlantic charter that we will be talking about today with a follow-on report in the coming weeks. Uh, on our panel today, we have our three co-chairs of the strategic dialogues, Shahrazad Akbar, chairperson, Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission, Secretary Madeleine Albright, former Secretary of State, United States, and member of the Atlantic Council's International Advisory Board. Rector Federica Mogherini, former EU High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security, and Rector for the College of Europe. Our co-chairs will be joined by Ambassador James Cunningham, former US Ambassador to Afghanistan, Israel, and the UN, and non-resident senior fellow of South Asia Center, the Atlantic Council. The conversation will begin uh, with a panel discussion moderated by my friend Roger Cohen, one of the best journalists I know of the New York Times, and will be followed by an audience Q&A where you may ask your questions via the chat function if you are joining us on Zoom. You can also submit your questions by using hashtag AC front page, hashtag AC front page. And with that, I'll pass the mic over to Stephen Hines, President and CEO of Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Well, thank you very much, Fred, um, and the Atlantic Council for your terrific partnership in this very important effort. I want to add my thanks to our three exceptional co-chairs uh, who have brought wisdom, dedication, and determination to our work. And I want to also express my appreciation to the more than 25 distinguished participants in the strategic dialogues who worked intensively together to define a shared vision for a peaceful, prosperous, and sovereign Afghanistan. I have had the honor to serve as facilitator of the dialogues, working closely with our absolutely terrific co-directors, Marika Theros and Sahar Alamzai, who have done a masterful job of pulling all this together, as Fred has said. We launched these dialogues in September of last year to convene diplomats, military officers, analysts, and civil society leaders from the US, Europe, and Afghanistan to work together in developing a long-term strategic outlook 
that could bring durable peace and security to Afghanistan, while also, as Fred has said, advancing shared Afghan, US, and European interests and values. And I wanna note that all of the dialogue participants served in their personal capacities. This process has been distinctive in its trilateral design, bringing together leaders from Europe, the US, with leading Afghans to develop a shared vision and a common set of principles, goals, and recommendations. This approach allowed us to shift discussions away from short-term political considerations to the ways in which a fuller partnership approach can support and advance shared interests and values in the long term. While the announced withdrawal of all coalition forces before September 11th certainly presents significant new challenges, our dialogues have focused on the full range of diplomatic, security, and financial levers that can be employed in partnership with the Afghan people to advance an integrated and durable peace and security framework. The road ahead will certainly not be easy, but the challenges are not insurmountable if the transatlantic community redefines its partnership with Afghanistan and commits to use the full array of non-military tools that remain available. So today we are releasing a transatlantic charter on Afghan sovereignty, security, and development. We have used the form of a charter to set forth a shared vision for Afghanistan's future, to articulate principles and goals, and to present a set of commitments we call on the transatlantic community to make in partnership with the Afghan people in the coming months and years. As Fred said, a rapporteur's report of our deliberations will follow in the coming weeks. The introduction to the charter written by our three co-chairs identifies a coordinated set of near-term actions that are urgently needed to mitigate the likely political and security consequences of the military withdrawal. These also align with our long-term vision and they include ongoing financial and technical support for the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces, a redoubling of sustained high-level regional diplomacy, utilizing all of the levers of influence to secure a comprehensive ceasefire, and developing a long-term partnership approach for this new chapter of Afghan history with a specific focus on the extraordinary generation of emerging Afghan leaders, women and men who have the vision dedication and talent to build the sovereign, secure, democratic and prosperous Afghanistan of the future. The dominant narrative about Afghanistan today focuses on the very profound challenges the country faces. They are undeniable, but this narrative misses the generational change that is transforming Afghanistan. And it is with these young leaders in mind that we issue this transatlantic charter. So it is now my pleasure to turn the program over to our moderator, my friend Roger Cohen, longtime foreign correspondent and columnist for the New York Times. And thanks for being with us, Roger. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, thank you, Fred. Uh, greetings to everybody from a sunny Paris. Uh, we meet at a delicate moment, as has been mentioned, uh, President Biden has announced uh, the withdrawal of coalition forces about four and a half months from now. Um, there's a lot of concern uh, to which Stephen alluded. Um, reports of a new swagger from the Taliban feels it's outlasted the enemy. A great deal of worry, concern on the part of women whose lives have improved uh, so much over the past uh, period. Um, journalists, concerned, uh, people who worked for the United States during this period, thousands of people, a lot of concern, but also a lot of hope uh, about the future. Um, Fred, I think you've already provided an introduction to all of our distinguished panelists, so I will not do that again. And uh, if I may, I will begin with, with a question to you, Secretary Albright. So in this um, change situation where we now know that a troop withdrawal is imminent. Um, do you feel that the work of this dialogue 
and the establishment of this transatlantic partnership is even more important. And what do you see as the key ways, the essential ways in which it can help end the forever war and bring about the inclusive democratic constitutional order that we hope for? Well, thank you very much, Roger. I've been an avid reader of yours for many years, and I am also very honored to have been a part of this discussion and <clears throat> learned an awful lot from my co-chairs, but also from all the discussions. And so uh, I think it has been an absolutely vital exercise, and I thank Stephen Heinz for what he has done uh, and always does, and to the Atlantic Council. And so um, I think that what we have done is even more important, as you uh, already indicated, I think, because uh, the whole document uh, and our discussion was filled with hope for difference uh, for the people of Afghanistan and the region and the world. And I think that we need to be even more focused on all of that now. I do think that the way that um, the points that are in the charter have been described, they really do provide uh, more than a roadmap, but a hope map, uh, I think in ways that allow us to look at what needs to be done. It really will require, obviously, the main people um, of Afghanistan, but also the transatlantic cooperation, which is essential, uh, and also uh, the sense <clears throat> that the region uh, has to be involved in a more active way and really try to figure out what the diplomatic opportunities are. And I think we'll spend a lot of time, <coughs> excuse me, discussing that. So thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here and delighted. And in many ways, I think that the charter now and it's coming out when it has is actually felicitous given the kinds of things that need to happen in order to bring peace and uh, a life to the next generation in Afghanistan and to uh, make clear that the women will continue to have a very large role. Thank you. Um, Chairperson Akbar, if I may turn to you now. Um, Secretary Albright just mentioned uh, the women of Afghanistan and uh, in assessing um, the impact uh, of this charter and of this commitment, I wonder if you could reflect on what you see as the particular challenge in maintaining and furthering the advances that Afghan women have achieved in recent years with the departure now of coalition troops. Um, thank you, Roger. I'm truly honored and humbled to be speaking to all of you today and to be part of this conversation and to have been part of this very important initiative. Uh, it stood out in many ways, not least because um, we Afghans were treated as partners, not just as beneficiaries. We were part of the conversation and in the room and shaping the conversation and the way um, it went forward. So while we were having the discussions around this charter in a very uncertain time, for Afghanistan, it gave me an, um, a lot of hope um, to see the solidarity, to see the thoughtfulness with, with, with which uh, Afghans, Europeans, and US experts and scholars engaged on um, the future of Afghanistan, despite all the uncertainty and despite many narratives of gloom um, and doom. Regarding women's participation in public life in Afghanistan, one of the main um, achievements of the past 20 years, although of course we must acknowledge that there is a historic background to this, Afghan women have been fighting for their rights for a very long time and for many generations. And they have had many setbacks, the worst of which was during the Taliban regime where uh, Afghan women were basically banned from the public life um, as a whole. Uh, in the past 20 years, there was another opportunity for Afghan women, and they really took it on despite the risks, despite huge sacrifices. We have lost many leading uh, women to targeted killings, um, starting as early as 2004, 2005. Um, but Afghan women have kept fighting, have kept the resilience, and I believe they will continue fighting. In the past um, two, three years, since the momentum around the peace talks and the US Taliban engagement, Afghan women have um, really mobilized more than any other constituency in Afghanistan to have their voices heard. 
um, by the world. Of course, this is a difficult moment. Um, there is a lot of concern. There is a lot of anxiety. But I do believe in the, in the resilience of uh, Afghan women and the Afghan women's movement and our allies. And I think what the Charter does at this moment is by reaffirming a commitment to Afghanistan by calling for a reaffirmation of um, transatlantic commitment to Afghanistan and by calling for regional engagement for a, a future democratic Afghanistan, it provides that uh, message of solidarity and hope for the Afghan women's movement that it's not, not everyone is thinking about just preventing the worst, but some of us are really planning to continue to build on what has been accomplished um, collectively and to um, improve and expand opportunities for all Afghan women, including those who didn't benefit from the opportunities because they lived in areas deeply affected by, by a conflict. But the key to reaching that would really be um, utilizing all our leverage for a ceasefire and for the success of the ongoing uh, peace talks. Thank you. Uh, Rector Mogherini. Um, You've been engaged in many difficult negotiations, uh, notably with Iran. Um, as you look at Afghanistan today, with the generational change that Stephen mentioned that is hopeful, but on the other hand, a, a weakened uh, president, Ashraf Ghani, described as increasingly isolated, um, a lot of concerns about the uh, future of the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces, um, a Taliban that in the past at least has always proved pretty much unwilling to compromise. Uh, how do you assess the contribution uh, that this strategic dialogue can make at this critical juncture? You know, uh, we have been thinking, uh, well, I skip first of all the thank you and the, uh, how uh, grateful and uh, honored I am uh, having had the chance of participating to this uh, a remarkable exercise. Uh, first of all, it's always a pleasure to be again with Madeleine, uh, uh, doing something hopefully relevant uh, for, for peace and security in the world, but also with Shirazad and uh, Stephen and all the, Fred, all the others that have uh, joined us in this um, uh, intense exercise in these months. And, you know, it, when we started in, in September, uh, the, the purpose of this exercise was indeed to try and, and shape uh, some recommendations or some way forward uh, in a moment when uh, uh, indeed uh, some changes were expected uh, one way or another uh, in the transatlantic approach uh, uh, in the partnership with Afghanistan. And then we are now today in a different uh, kind of uh, scenario where I would say uh, the uncertainty uh, is uh, probably um, even more there. Um, the withdrawal of troops uh, opens uh, a window of uncertainty that is probably bigger than the one we expected uh, uh, to be in, back in September last year. Um, but um, it is true that in any negotiation, the more critical uh, and the more uncertain the path forward uh, is, the more relevant uh, the behavior of each of the player become. And so actually recommendations and ideas on how to support uh, women, girls, uh, the younger generations in Afghanistan from all different sides, uh, from inside, from within Afghanistan, from the neighboring uh, uh, countries, from the region, from the international organizations, from Europe, from the United States, uh, becomes, I believe, today even more relevant. Um, we have somehow, I think, uh, the collective responsibility that is uh, first and foremost an Afghan responsibility, but it's also a shared transatlantic responsibility to protect lives, because as Sherazad was mentioning, the killings have increased recently, and we have the duty to protect and the interest to protect uh, those courageous uh, women and girls and, and young people that uh, are trying to change Afghanistan, to protect their lives, to protect their hopes, to protect their dreams, also to protect the empowerment that they have felt in these years, and also to protect the gains that have been achieved in Afghanistan. Um, I. Um, I, I know so many uh, brave, courageous, and smart, and, and, and brilliant uh, women and girls, young people in Afghanistan that do want to shape a different future for, for its country and definitely do want to go back. So I think that today we have uh, obviously the lucidity of all the difficulties that are around the table, especially the negotiating table and potentially the battlefield. But we also know that uh, the outcome is not uh, written away. Um, that it, there's no certainty in, in any way. There's no certainty that uh, 
that Afghanistan is going to, to, to implode, and there's no certainty that it's going to have a bright future. So whatever we can do in these months to determine the outcome of this coming uh, weeks and, and months on the ground, at the negotiating table, in the region, and in the international community, can indeed make a difference. And the difference we make is not just a diplomatic one, it's a security one, and it's a very deep difference for the lives of every single Afghan. With the focus on the Afghan ownership, I think what Shirazad mentioned today is, uh, is crucial. It's them in the lead, and our responsibility is to support the hope of this new Afghan generation. Um, thank you very much. Um, Ambassador Cunningham, um, you have extensive experience of the country, both as ambassador, as deputy ambassador before that. Um, how, how real, clearly pulling troops out is a risk. Um, it's a risk. How, how real is the danger that terrorism could become resurgent, that the Afghanistan could relapse into um, all out civil war, um, you've observed the Taliban up close, how realistic is the idea of power sharing when you're dealing with uh, a group like that? Um, if you could please uh, address um, those questions, that would be great. And, and also, I did note in the charter that it alludes to the need for, quote, a security presence, close quote. Um, how would you envisage that security present to avert what I just described. To start with the end of your question, um, arranging for an ongoing security presence is going to be a real challenge now. The, the presence of the international military forces in Afghanistan was really, in my view, an insurance policy. It's a low cost and I thought sustainable insurance policy. And now we're going to be dealing with a heightened risk as you, as you noted, a strategic risk to the United States and not just the United States, but to our partners too. And that's part of the importance of this charter. Uh, we Americans tend to look at this as an American issue. It's, it's not, we have had not just Europeans, but many coalition partners involved in this venture over the years. And that coalition exists because it was perceived that there was a risk to security for all of us. And that risk still exists. So the question now is going to be, as we withdraw the insurance policy, can we use, as the administration said, all the tools in our toolbox to create a different kind of insurance policy that's geared towards pr providing security for Afghanistan, helping the Afghans provide security for themselves and their own people, and more importantly, shaping the diplomatic political background that's required to get the Taliban into an actual negotiation about peace in the country. And that's that will require a very determined uh, political and diplomatic effort um, with our European partners and others aimed at mitigating the, the new risks that have now been created and trying to create a new political process combined with ongoing uh, sh um, security assistance to the Afghans that can keep focused on trying to get uh, the Taliban uh, into its genuine negotiation about peace in the future of the country. Thank you. Um, Secretary Albright, in, in the next months, um, <coughs> What concrete um, act um, would you like to see from the United States and its allies that conveys powerfully to all the actors in Afghanistan that we are not abandoning it? Uh, well, I think that, um, first of all, we are not abandoning it. Uh, it is clear that uh, there are going to be um, as uh, Ambassador Cunningham and you asked, uh, basically about using the tools in our toolbox. And some of it is that we will continue to be supportive of the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces that we have been training and that really are in a position now to play uh, an active role. We also uh, are going to be providing aid 
uh, there has now been a determination that there would be um, American assistance, 300 million going in, in terms of trying to build up some of the economic uh, aspects of what need to be done um, in Afghanistan. Uh, and, uh, and then also there will be an offshore way of being very vigilant on the security issue and the intelligence issues. Um, and we can talk more about those, but there are very, there's some very specific aspects of that. I do think that one of the aspects of this whole program and things that we talked about uh, in our discussions is the role of regional diplomacy and the regional powers really playing some kind of a role. And I wanna put this very starkly. It is time for Pakistan to take a positive role and to try to show that it can make a difference in terms of having a peaceful Afghanistan. Uh, they have a very important role to play. The other countries in the region do also, but I think that we need to make very clear that uh, they have to play a more productive role than they have. And then I also do think that as we talked about the transatlantic cooperation, that it isn't just the United States alone, but our partners, and that we attention will continue to be paid. Uh, and I think that that is something that has to keep being stressed. But the regional diplomacy, I hope we can examine that a little bit more in the course of our discussions. But Secretary Albright, have we not been saying that to Pakistan for 20 years? Why would we expect them to behave differently given their perception of the Pashtun Taliban uh, from the way they behaved in the past, which has largely, I think, been to listen to us politely and then do not a whole lot? Well, I have to say that they uh, have been a complex party to deal <laughs> with all, all this time, but I do think that with more um, hope and international pressure on them and the possibility that they will, in fact, uh, be regarded with respect in the region, I think is something that is very important. But, um, and besides, you know, hope is eternal. But I really do think that as we look at the regional aspect of this and understanding that the countries in the region have a stake in having a peaceful Afghanistan, not, um, I mean, as I've understood the Pakistani position, they have felt often that the turmoil in the region has made their life more complicated. The bottom line is they can be major players in stopping the turmoil instead of contributing to it in a number of different ways. But I, I think it was interesting, frankly, uh, how much time we spent talking about the regional aspect of this. Uh, and uh, I think that there have been also positive signs in terms of some of the things that the Russians and the Chinese, the um, meeting that they held uh, brought out some uh, positive points that needed to be done. And I think that there needs to be a motivation of the region and the international community that this isn't just an Afghan problem and it isn't just an American problem, that this really is something that is essential, but mostly, uh, and I really, uh, so appreciate what Shahrazad said in terms of the importance to the Afghan people uh, for this to go forward in a way that is more positive. You think that China and Russia could be helpful. Um, it's easy to imagine President Putin and President Xi Jinping seeing Afghanistan as fertile terrain to make trouble for the United States. Well, I think that uh, if we do not present this as only, quote, an American problem, I mean, I find very interesting the region uh, in so many ways and looking at the kinds of things that have been going on um, in Central Asia and just generally in the Pacific, that this is something that is not, it can't be, it can't be seen as just an American issue uh, and uh, because it is not just an American issue. And if one also looks at the things that need to be done internationally in terms of countering terrorism, which in many ways is now being franchised uh, into various other parts of the world, uh, that we need to deal with this in a, in a broader international scope. Uh, Chairperson Akbar, um, I think it would be helpful for all of us if with your detailed knowledge, you could try to summarize quickly, um, 
how Afghanistan, in your view, has changed culturally, socially, um, really in every way um, during this last period that um, American and other troops have been present uh, in the country. That's a way of asking if the mission has been worthwhile, has it? Thank you, Roger. Um, I think a lot has been achieved that is not easily um, measurable because it's a lot about social and cultural change. And I think you can see that if you if you live here and you have a sense of kind of um, the history of the country as uh, as uh, people who have been observing it for a long time or people who have been living here for generations. Um, what I can see even in my own uh, extended community among friends is that many of the women that I know who are in positions of prominence or um, are uh, prominent activists, um, um, people who are making change in Afghanistan, who are having an impact in Afghanistan, come from families where um, their mothers uh, were not literate. Uh, they, they could not read and write. Uh, so it's a huge change in one generation where you see um, women and men from across Afghanistan from different social and ethnic backgrounds uh, because literacy used to be seen as a privilege for specific groups who lived in specific areas, for instance, in the past. But you see women and men from different parts of Afghanistan, different ethnic and social backgrounds, uh, having access to a, a whole lot of opportunities. You also see how the value of education has really changed. When my father was growing up in a village in North Afghanistan, um, people in his village would bribe the school officials to, school, uh, to, to close the school or to prevent the school from opening because they believed that if their boys went to school, that they would get a lot of ideas that were unhelpful for them. And they were uh, really invested in keeping the children involved in farming and helping with the family and community. In the same village, people are substituting the salaries of female teachers so that their daughters can now go to school. And from the same village, there are girls now who are studying in India and in Turkey. So you can see that the extent of social and cultural change, yes, the opportunities were made by the international communities present in Afghanistan, but I think there should be credit given to the ordinary Afghans who, after a lot of suffering, a lot of war and migration and experience of being refugees, really came to this conclusion that in order to build a better future for Afghanistan, they have to invest in their children, they have to invest in educating their children, that they have to raise their daughters and sons with the ideas of them becoming, you know, contributors to the society rather than soldiers for a war. It has been unfortunate that in the past 20 years we have continued the conflict, but I think what does give me hope is that the while there is con continued conflict, uh, that there is an overwhelming desire for stopping it. There is an overwhelming desire for a ceasefire and for progress and for prosperity. And yes, people's ambitions and aspirations might vary. Like in any, and, uh, any country, uh, even in the United States, if you go to different parts of the country, people have different social attitudes and uh, beliefs about issues, but there is a shared aspiration of among uh, especially women for wanting more, for wanting better lives. And that is an incredible social and cultural change. You see women participating in elections, running in elections, participating in politics. You see the freedom of expression in Afghanistan, despite the fact that we had one of the most difficult years for journalists in terms of the numbers of journalists that we lost, we still come out in rankings as one of the countries with uh, more free media compared to many countries in the region, including, for instance, India. So. This is the sort of transformation that has happened. Um, is it enough to prevent the worst on our own? I think th that's a question that many of us are grappling with and, and worried and concerned about because this conflict is broader than us. It's broader than just an Afghan conflict. It has regional dimensions as Secretary Albright and other colleagues also spoke about. But I think it's enough for us that if, if we have some continued uh, level of constructive engagement and partnership to to really slowly transition to something better. Thank you very much. Um, Rector Mogherini, um, looking at, at, at that last point, uh, in your assessment, in your strategic assessment, have these social and cultural changes now gone so far, so far transforming the country that to imagine a return to an Islamic emirate of Afghanistan uh, under the Taliban is, is impossible, that, that, it, that it cannot happen. The country 
has moved out of the range of that possibility. Is that what you believe? I don't want to be pessimistic. I'm always optimistic, but I, I'm afraid that change is always possible both ways. And uh, uh, we should be um, careful and not uh, giving uh, the negative changes for granted. So I think we should not uh, uh, allow ourselves to imagine that the worst is inevitable today or tomorrow. But also, I think we should be um, aware of the fact that, uh, indeed, uh, going backwards uh, is probably today much more difficult than it was 10 or 15 years ago because of the changes in culture and society that Shazad was mentioning. But I am afraid that negative changes, backwards um, steps, even relevant one, uh, would still be possible. What I believe is that uh, the majority of the Afghan people would not want them to happen. And so if they are, I think, uh, allowed to and provided with uh, institutional tools inside Afghanistan to express their will and to uh, participate to the shaping of the present and the future of the country, uh, those um, steps backwards would not happen. I trust the Afghan people to determine a bright future for their, for their country. And I also trust uh, the regional powers and players and the neighboring countries uh, the, the regional players and the neighboring countries don't completely coincide uh, if you look at the borders of Afghanistan. I think that the neighbors in particular, but also the regional powers, have actually an interest in uh, trying to have Afghanistan moving forward uh, on the uh, path of democracy and, and rule of law and, uh, and human rights. And, and I think that if, um, uh, as, as the charter points out, uh, if now the withdrawal of troops doesn't translate into, into a withdrawal of support, uh, which we all hope will not happen, and we are determined to make sure it doesn't happen. Uh, and there is now, in the coming months and, and, and weeks, uh, an intensified attention to accompanying the peace talks in using the leverage that each of the players has at regional and international level to um, keep the Taliban at the table and uh, condition the talks in a way that common ground can be found for a democratic Afghanistan to, to take shape uh, and, and uh, in the end of a process that can be internationally supported. Uh, I think that this is still possible today because at the end of the day, um, the, the regional players and the neighboring countries do have an interest, uh, security and economic wise, uh, to have Afghanistan moving forward. And, you know, Europeans know it by experience. Uh, we, we transitioned from centuries of wars that we even exported worldwide to uh, not only peace uh, and economic prosperity and stability, but even political integration uh, as a continent. In the moment when we started to share economic interests, it all started with the coal and steel, uh, something very, not really inspiring and romantic, but when we started to share economic interests, so it was not convenient anymore for any of us to fight each other. It was much more beneficial to make business together rather than to fight each other. I think that if, if we manage as an international community, as Europeans, as Americans, as, as, uh, as the UN, to, uh, to, to trigger the positive leverages that are there for each of the players, those around the table today and those that are not yet around the table today, to try and contribute their bits to serve their own self-interest, which is a connectivity interest, an energy interest, an economic interest, a security interest. I think that then possibilities for the Taliban to revert to a situation of uh, decades before uh, would be extremely limited, uh, if, not, uh, uh, if not irrelevant, combined with the will that I believe is there uh, of the Afghan people uh, to preserve uh, the achievements that they have built uh, in this last two decades. Well, that's a nice, hopeful European note um, uh, with the uh, possibility you suggest that such a model might even be transferred to that part of Asia. Uh, even if we do have 150,000 Russian troops massed on the Ukrainian border, but let's hope that doesn't go any further. Uh, Ambassador Cunningham, um, how do you rate the, can you give us a, a tough realistic assessment of the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces. Uh, we've been giving, I think, four billion a year uh, to this outfit, um, and they've clearly done very important work. But the onus 
is going to be on them now, big time. And um, so how do you rate them? There's a lot of, I've read several reports of, uh, of road, hundreds of roadblocks being abandoned, of this Taliban swagger, they feel they've, they've won. They've outlasted the enemy. I think uh, our correspondent Adam Nossiter wrote something to that effect recently. Um, so how good are these forces and uh, can they hold the line? I think most experts believe that they can hold the line as long as they continue to receive um, financial support and, and other kinds of security assistance. It's important to remember the Afghan security forces have been um, in the lead of combat operations since 2013. Um, they've been doing all of the fighting for years now with, with American and, and international support. Much of that international support is, is devoted towards training and assistance, not towards operations within the field, even by the United States. Our focus has been on counterterrorism and some uh, strategic support to the Afghans in terms of uh, air support and things like that. So that's the, the dilemma now it is going to be how to continue to provide some kind of basic support for the security forces as they go about doing their, their job, which they have been doing. Um, Obviously, it's it's a it's a difficult proposition, but they have been performing. They've been holding in the field. They have uh, commandos and special operations forces that are very very capable. So all of all of that um, is in the mix. The the real question I think is, can the Afghan political elite perform? Um, <laughs> this is as much a political issue as it is a security issue, right. and the onus has been on them for some time going back for years to find a way to coalesce and develop an effective national political program. And now that's doubly important as with the prospect of negotiations ahead and with the uh, uncertainty created by the withdrawal of the international security forces, which by the way, our partners wanted to maintain, that is our European coalition partners. They did not want to withdraw and they didn't want to see the Americans withdraw because of those shared security interests that I talked about earlier. So this is now all before us. The bottom line is- So, so should we have listened to the Europeans? In my view, yes. We listened to the Europeans before, by the way, in previous administrations when uh, preparations were being made, for instance, by President Obama to withdraw all forces by the end of 2014. It was the Europeans who came to us and said, we think you're, you, we think that's too fast and too soon, too steep a curve. Mm -hmm. And President Obama, to his credit, uh, eventually course corrected. But the- uh, but Would there ever be a good moment to withdraw? I mean, it's 20 years now. This is not actually the longest US military deployment <laughs> in American history. Okay. Right. So the question is, what do you need to do to maximize your chances of succeeding in what you wanna do, right. which is securing Afghanistan and stabilizing it? Mm -hmm. So there's no deadline on security. The question is what, how do you manage the risk and how do you increase your prospects for success? Now we're about to enter negotiations. Right. I don't think it maximizes the prospect for success to say, yes, we want to negotiate peace, but we're going to withdraw our forces. Mm -hmm. That's what the president decided otherwise. Mm -hmm. So now we need to, we need to course correct. And that's where this concept of the transatlantic mm -hmm. uh, partnership, this partnership of uh, America, Europeans and Afghans is really crucial because at the end, this is a political question. It's not a military question. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna to turn to a few questions from the audience. Um, uh, there's one that says, um, if Afghanistan <coughs> returns to civil war, how serious is the threat to the EU? And I'm gonna add the United States and, and elsewhere, posed by irregular migration, international terrorism and drug trafficking. Um, Maybe I could, as I'm, you just spoke, uh, Ambassador Cunningham, maybe you could take that question and then I'll turn to Rector Mogherini on the same question. Uh, I mean, if, if Afghanistan uh, doesn't go in the direction that, that we all want, uh, could it again be a big base for international terrorism, uh, drug trafficking, migration issues, other issues? Um, yes, there's no question that that's a possibility. Uh, maybe even a significant possibility. Um, those of us who've been looking this, uh, looking at this 
is precisely this issue over the past couple of years, think that if, if there is return to, the process will be returned to civil war because to go back to your earlier question and discussion, I don't think many Afghans will accept the, re, the establishment of, of the uh, Islamic Emirate. If the, if the Taliban try to impose that, I think there will be conflict and there will, there will be civil war. So that then produces its own set of follow on consequences, one of which is large amounts of ungoverned space with the Taliban that, whose commitment to combating terrorism certainly does not uh, equate to that of the current Afghan government. So then you have a possibility of open spaces, you have refugees fleeing, which the Europeans have very unpleasant experience with. And uh, it will be a much more difficult and unstable situation for all of us in the region and, and on the outside. Thank you. Uh, Rector Mogherini, just very quickly on the same question. Do you yes. see a really sort of direct threat to Europe, to the EU, if if there were a negative uh, development, which you didn't exclude in Afghanistan? Absolutely, yes. Uh, for the European Union, for the region, for the United States, uh, uh, in security terms, uh, uh, destabilization of the region, further destabilization of the region, uh, definitely, yes, for sure. And. Uh, if I can also comment on the uh, on the uh, on the issue of the withdrawal on a calendar base, um, Europeans have insisted indeed uh, on having a withdrawal, and you know Europeans are not uh, usually the ones that are insisting to keep a military operation ongoing for 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 longer than than the United States, <laughs> rather the contrary. We used to come from Venice once upon a time, but uh, uh, Europeans have always insisted on on a, a condition based withdrawal. Uh, that indeed, in the moment when you start a, a peace talk, uh, can be a very powerful leverage at the negotiating table. Uh, but this is now behind us. Uh, but indeed, yes, in Europe, we feel uh, that this, uh, um, what happens in Afghanistan, for good and for bad, has an impact on, on Europe. Definitely, yes. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Albright, here is, a, here is another question uh, from our audience um, as follows. Um, over the past year or two, one of the biggest outcomes of the talks has been the legitimacy given to the Taliban. The Taliban haven't fulfilled their commitment and they continue to be rewarded for their bad behavior. Given only the past two years, why should Afghans be hopeful that if the Taliban commit more crimes, the US and the international community will stand by the Afghan people? Well, let me say, I do think that um the Taliban have a choice to make at this time. They can, in fact, be uh, pragmatic or they can be permanent pariahs. Uh, and uh, it appears to me that they want certain things like including international recognition and legitimacy and international development assistance uh, and a lifting of UN sanctions, uh, the ability for the leaders to travel freely. And none of this is gonna happen if the Taliban uh, were to deepen their already violent um, conflict or not fulfill the obligations and whatever peace settlement is reached. And I do think that uh, they obviously have a key role to play here and they can make a choice, uh, but they are the ones that have to recognize the fact that they cannot go on like this either. I do think, however, and I, and I hate, uh, I'm often asked if I'm an optimist or a pessimist. I'm an optimist who worries a lot. So I am worried that various parts of this, as my colleagues have been saying, will happen, but I prefer now to look at this as a way for us to change the dynamics in the ways that many of us have talked about, but we have to be prepared. And it really does make a difference in terms of the way that the Afghan government uh, now begins to look at the political issues, how to deal with the internal problems that Afghanistan has had in terms of some of the issues to do with corruption and uh, drug trafficking and a variety of different things. And that this is, an, from the American perspective, I think it has to be an all of government approach that um, we need to look at the tools we have. And I hope very much that it will in fact have the cooperation of um, the Europeans in many different ways and that we will not just adopt, the president's made a decision and I think that we need to look at, with the help of this charter uh, and the kinds of discussions that we've had, to go in a direction where we look at 
what the options are and push where we need to and not just say, you know, we've had it. We don't want anything more to do with it because that is not what has been said. It is going to be a different approach. And I'm very pleased that the kinds of ideas that have come out of this um, uh, uh, exercise, I think, that we've had that has been very honest in terms of looking at what we need to do to make sure that the various pieces of this stay intact. And I really do think, just to follow up on something that um, I have felt strongly about along with my colleagues, the women's role in this is absolutely key. We cannot solve the problem on the backs of the women, uh, that this has to be an, an integral part in terms of making the thing work. Uh, Chairperson Akbar, um, do, for Afghans, does the idea of the Taliban ever sharing power just make them laugh? I think many in Afghanistan now want a political solution and support a political solution and support a peace process. Uh, the suffering of Afghans, um, it, it has been too much suffering. It has been too much bloodshed. And we, we realize that we do have to try to find ways to reconcile our differences without continued violence. The question is, are Taliban listening to this? Have they reached this conclusion? Uh, I mean, one of the most the strongest public demands in Afghanistan for two, three years now has been a ceasefire, declaration of a ceasefire. Um, religious scholars are asking for this. Ordinary Afghans are asking for this. Afghans in rural areas, which Taliban um, claim to you know, have more affiliation with, are asking for this. But Taliban are not listening. Uh, there is a huge desire for peace. Uh, this Taliban should see this. When as you say a huge desire, you mean like a clear majority of Afghans want this? in your view? I think clear majority of Afghans want a political process, want to try to solve this through talks. And they are supportive of talks despite all the suffering, all the grievances, all the all the traumatic memories that we also have from the Taliban uh, period. Despite that, people want uh, a political solution to this conflict. And that's an opportunity for Taliban, if they are willing to take it, to sit down and really genuinely engage in discussions to resolve the differences in a way that's nonviolent, because the biggest, the biggest um, uh, cost has been borne by the uh, ordinary Afghans and by civilians in this conflict. Um, quick, wait, I think getting probably to the last question, if not the penultimate. Um, so I'll direct this to Ambassador Cunningham. Is this a moment for shifting priorities from counter terror to the security of Afghans? I'm not sure those are contradictory aims, but anyway. These goals are not always compatible, uh, this person says. And in the past, defeating terror has taken precedence over domestic stability. What do you think about that? Well, I, I agree with you. I don't think they are, it's not one or the other. Um, mm. They go together. And as I said before, actually most, most of the work on counterterrorism right now, or in the first the last several years has been done by the Afghans themselves. Mm -hmm. with uh, with foreign assistance, including uh, including American assistance. But they have a they are a partner in countering terrorism in Af on Afghan territory. And that's a very important asset to have. This is an, an Islamic state that's working with us to counter violent Islamic terrorism. And that's a very important phenomenon that's not uh, that's not well appreciated, I think, outside of the country. And I don't think the premise of the question that somehow we or the Afghan government have been slighting the security of the Afghan paper, people uh, in favor of a counterterrorism effort, I don't think that's correct. Okay, last question quickly to uh, Rector Mogherini. Uh, what leverage is available to bring the Taliban to the negotiating table and ensure the process is conditions-based? What leverage, what leverage do we have? Does the U.S. have? Does Europe have? Does anyone have? Well, we do have a leverage because, uh, to my knowledge, the Taliban are willing to be delisted uh, as a terrorist organization and group. So this is the first leverage we have uh, yeah. to link this to results uh, at, uh, at the negotiating table. Uh, then we have uh, we can have positive leverage. Uh, the European Union, for instance, can do a lot to accompany the implementation of a reconciliation process once an agreement is done in terms of uh, 
uh, rehabilitation, reintegration support for families of former combatants. It's something we've done in many different countries uh, post-war, including post-civil war, uh, uh, all over history, including in Europe. And then there's the leverage that uh, the neighboring countries and the region uh, can have uh, on the Taliban. And we can uh, have leverage on those that have leverage. Uh, and I think that uh, this might uh, be used at a certain moment in positive terms and in negative terms. I, I believe in leverage both ways. I also believe in incentives uh, to do good. So incentives to do no harm and incentives to do good. But I think the first step would be not to delist uh, the Taliban from the terrorist organizations. Thank you very much. Well, I think there's no doubt that this strategic dialogue and this charter have contributed to an increased the chances of the Afghanistan of uh, inclusive democratic constitutional government. Long shot as that may remain, uh, this is an extraordinary effort. And I'd like to thank all the panelists um, for joining me today. And with that, I will hand things back to Fred Kemp. Thank, thank you so much, Roger. <coughs> uh, Roger was a longtime colleague of mine at the Wall Street Journal. I first went to Afghanistan in 1985-1986 when I took one of the trips behind Soviet lines as a, uh, with the Mujahideen. Um, and I really learned uh, to love the Afghan people and their heroism. The country has come so far, yet it has so far yet to go. These are crucial months ahead. Uh, perhaps not helped uh, by the uh, nature of the withdrawal of September 11th, but that really depends on us. It depends on the transatlantic community, it depends on the countries in the region. It does depend on the Afghan people, Afghan leadership, and in Pakistan, of course. Um, I really uh, want to thank everyone who came here today. I want to thank the co-chairs, the three co-chairs and Ambassador Cunningham, I want to uh, thank Sahar and Marika, our own team, Irfan Nuruddin, the director of the South Asia Center, and Harris Samad, uh, uh, and of course, Stephen Hines and the Rockefeller Brothers Foundation, our tremendous partners uh, in this ongoing work. Our work in Afghanistan does not end here, it can't end here. We want to continue to be a leading voice in shaping policy surrounding Afghanistan because there is so much to be done, not just for the good of the Afghan people, but really for the region and, uh, and outsized importance in the larger world. Uh, keep an eye out for the report that will follow uh, in the coming days. We also invite you to our next Atlantic Council front page event, taking place April 29th at 3 p.m. Eastern time for, on the U.S. strategy for the artificial intelligence era uh, with the U.S. National Security uh, commission. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us uh, and thank you to all those involved and we'll see you the next time. Mm -hmm.